The real issue here is how do you coordinate distributed computers if there is no global time? So that's one unfortunate consequence is there is no such thing as global time that everyone can just have and, and coordinate against. Um, and there's a couple issues here. Uh, one is called clock drift, which is that if you have a clock, say that's supposed to measure seconds, like your cheap clock on your motherboard, it's going to drift. So that means that it's going to be, it's, a second is defined as a, a certain number of vibrations of a cesium atom. This thing is going to drift away from that. And over time, it's going to drift in one direction or the other, either, either go ahead or, or behind. And the amount of drift is something that you can't, you can predict to some extent, but it's not, you can't predict with perfect accuracy. There's another term called clock skew, which is a relative term, which is that if you have two clocks, the difference between them at any one point is clock skew. So this is something, a term that you'll see used when you're, when you're thinking about two systems that are supposed to be synchronized or that were synchronized at some point uh, at some degree of accuracy. Then over time, their clocks will, will, will develop some difference and they'll be what's called skew. So the approach to try to coordinate computers is to try to bound the amount of skew. Um, because if you can have two computers that you, or two systems that you can coordinate at any one time, for maybe they were close together with a certain amount of, uh, with a, a certain bound on the skew, you want that skew to, to be the amount that get, that it, uh, the amount of skew that develops over time to be minimal. Now why do we want to coordinate? Um, well, there's timestamps on files. We saw that some, that one of the ways that you decide whether a file, which file to use, like in, in uh, which version to use in some systems is, like Grapevine is whichever has the greater timestamp. Um, there are certificates which have valid dates. Uh, and so that requires that whatever times you have in your certificate be consistent with what other uh, computers think is the time. A couple ways um, to synchronize two systems. One is to use an external clock and one is to use local clocks. So when you do an, when you do an external clock, this is something like trying to use the, uh, the global positioning system will transmit, for example, uh, clock pings. Or there's, there's some internet protocols we'll get into that, that uh, try to help you uh, ex use an external clock to coordinate. Um, you can also just do internal, which is to use your local clocks. If you just want to uh, synchronize with someone else and you're not really, you don't really care too much about whether other people outside you are synchronized, you can just try to do that with the other person directly. And uh, by definition, if, you ha if you're externally synchronized, you're internally synchronized, but the opposite isn't true. So one way to, that you can, so let's take just the simplest approach to synchronize two systems is you send a message over and it has a timestamp in it. Let's say the message says T. Um, and let's say the sender and the, and the receiver. Um, now let's assume that the, that the round trip time here is something that they know in this case. So then what the receiver can do is say, well, once I get this, I'll just set my time to whatever T is plus the round, um, plus the round trip delay time over two. Right, so this is some. This is one. This is the, the very simplest way to do it. Um, you can even there. You can get a little bit more sophisticated if you think there's some minimum processing time for this. You can add that in. And uh, and so you know you can you can go back and forth here and do this many times and 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 try to figure out this RT to to the best degree you can. Now in a in an asynchronous system. This becomes a little bit more simple because, you, as you remember, this is all this channel here is time division multiplex. There's a uh, some kind of a guarantee about when things will arrive. Um, but in an asynchronous system, uh, like the internet, where the mess, where it's best efforts, this round trip delay time can change. There's congestion along the way. There's a bunch of issues that we saw. So this uh, this type of of synchronization ends up being. Uh, there's, there's algorithms that you can do to try to do this, but it ends up being more useful as you get more locality and as the round trip times become more predictable. Um, now one of, the, one of the, I know some of you got the bank vault problem as a synchronization problem. And there, the reason you can synchronize so well is because it's an asynchronous system in a sense that you have these different pieces of the system that all, you know that every clock tick they're going to communicate. 
Uh, and if they don't communicate, then you can assume that they had nothing to say. Um, whereas if it had been an, asynchronous, or an asynchronous type of communication between them, you wouldn't have been able to, to uh, solve it that way. So what do, you, what do people actually do? Um, let's look at something practical. On the internet, there's something called the network time protocol. And there's actually programs, some, a lot of freeware stuff, especially you can go out there and grab. And what it does is it, it, try, it goes out there and f figures out what the time is and sets your clock to make sure that, there's, that the skew on your clock is minimized. And the goal is of the network time protocol is to synchronize computers on a large network to some uh, to what's called coordinated universal time and UTC is the the French version of it and that's what they call it now um, and what what so what else do you want you want reliability so if parts of this NTP infrastructure get cut off from each other you want it to be the case that you can still have some amount of of being able to synchronize until it comes back together again you want it to provide a lot less drift than the motherboard clocks, because otherwise you could just use your motherboard clocks. Um, that's, not, <laughs> that's not too hard to do, because these motherboard clocks are pretty cheap, actually. Um, and then you also want some amount of security against denial of service and spoofing. Spoofing is really important, because if someone knows you're using NTP, or some, I'm sorry, if someone knows that you're using some time protocol that, that isn't very secure against spoofing, then they could do something like, like foil your, your certificates, your encryption, by telling you that it's a different date. For example, they can revalidate one of your certificates by saying, oh, even though the valid dates are between this and this, and we're over here, I'm going to make you think we're somewhere within that valid date period. Um, so this is one reason why uh, having the right time is important from a security point of view. So the implementation of NTP is actually UDP-based. You don't need a lot of the TCP overhead. And it ends up being hierarchical. So what you have are tiers. You have primary servers. It's a lot, it's a lot like DNS in the, in the sense. And these go down all the way until you have your local workstations. And the idea here is that these primary servers are connected to some kind of real UTP, UTC time source. So this could be something like at, the, uh, at NIST uh, or, or somewhere where they ha you have a real atomic clock with you know, the cesium and all of that good stuff that's coordinated. Uh, but this thing is typically something where the clock is either is directly attached or is part of that server itself. And what these guys do is that's how these synchronize is to these, to these clocks. And there's ways that we're assuming that there's ways that the, that universal that UTC is actually coordinated outside the infrastructure of, of the internet. Um, one of the ways that, by the way, that you can that you can coordinate is um, GPS will sends uh, pings, and you can use that to try to coordinate as a way outside the internet. Um, then what happens is that who's ever lower in this hierarchy, these guys the next level layer down coordinates their time with these primary servers. And what you do is you keep doing that until you're down at the workstation level. And then you coordinate your time with one of those local, local guys. So because of the hierarchy here, the number of layers to the, to the actual clock is an uh, uh, order log of the n of the total number of, of servers here. Um, and so let's dig a little bit deeper into this. So imagine that, that one of these guys gets disconnected. So this guy gets disconnected from here. Um, what you can do then is you can say, well, if I have some way of, of some I connection to over here, let's say you get, you get disconnected from this whole layer here, this one does, then you can say, oh, well, I have these other guys in my same tier that I can try to synchronize with. So if I can't synchronize with someone that's better than me, i.e. higher 
in the hierarchy, I'm going to try to synchronize with those people who are synchronizing with them. And as that happens, then in essence, this guy becomes one of the nodes that's a layer down here. Uh, so by, when something gets cut off, in essence, what happens is its position in the hierarchy shifts. And it's just, it'll, in this case, this, this tree right here will shift down one layer. So this is one of the ways that you handle disconnections gracefully. Instead of this guy just giving up, he just says, well, I'm a little less accurate. Uh, now, there's three ways that you can do this uh, synchronization uh, when, you're, when you're doing two of these together. Um, one is called, one is multicast, which typically works best on high-speed LANs. So if one of these servers is on a LAN, it could multicast out or broadcast out its time every, on, reg, on a regular basis, and these guys would all pick it up. Now, this tends to work much better on a high-speed LAN because the propagation delay is going to be minim, minimized. And if you might actually know some properties, enough properties about this uh, LAN that you can adjust the clock depending on you know where you are, and, and you can probably have some a little bit better guarantees about um, getting packets to you. There's uh, another one that's a procedure call based, and this is something that, that you'll be reading about in the book. There's, there's several algorithms. There's one called, called Christian's algorithm that's probabilistic. So the idea there is you, these delays and these different parameters that tend to um, interfere with your being able to know exactly how much what, what these types, what this is over here, you can build a model for that and use that to try to minimize the error time. Uh, that's introduced when you do the synchronization. And then finally, there's um, symmetric, um, which is typically used up at the higher layers. And symmetric is that you're always exchanging messages. And in these messages, you have different pieces of data. You have, um, for each message that you send, you have, you store what time that message was sent. You record what time that message was received. And you do the same for the message that, that you send. So you have two sends and two receive times for each of those messages. Well, some of that information is embedded in the, in the messages. Some of it's something you record. And if you, in the text, you'll see that they have this, this nice uh, algorithm for using that to try to minimize and to try to, to try to minimize the amount of error that's introduced into the, uh, into the synchronization. Um, but the main thing is, the main point here is that these top layers here, you want to be as synchronized as possible. You're willing to give, to make the load a little bit higher. And as you go down in the layers, you, you recognize that there's going to be, that you, there is going to be some difference from the higher layers, um, but you try to do your best there. So one of the reasons that you'd actually that, that you need to, to worry about time is that there's there's certain functions that you want to carry out when you think about distributed systems, and one is a distributed mutual exclusion. Now, did you guys talk about mutual exclusion in your in any of the previous courses? Nothing. Okay. So mutual exclusion, when you share a resource. There's piece, there's, there's, so let's take a disk drive as an example. When you share a resource, there are typically uh, what are called critical sections. And these can be, they, they can be code that you, that you should only really have one process at a time or one person at a time running through that whole code, any piece of that code before someone else does. So let's imagine that, the, uh, that there's a, um, a piece of code that writes, that's actually just writing bits out to the disk, or writing bits out. Ethernet is another good one. So, the, what, so if, you're, if you, there's a piece of code that writes to the, to the Ethernet, suppose that there's something that says, here's a packet. I'm going to send out a packet. You actually would prefer that only one person be sending out, putting bits on that Ethernet when it's sending out a packet at a time. And the reason is, if you have two processes, and one of them starts writing out a packet, and then some, some kind of context switch happens, and then the other one starts writing out its packet, then you're going to have this jumbled mess on the line. So what you do is you say one packet at a time. So when you start writing a packet, you, have to, you finish writing the packet before someone else can start writing another packet. So what that means that the, is that these processes have to be mutually ex, have to have mutual ex, mutually exclusive access 
to the code that writes to this Ethernet card. So anytime you have a shared resource, you'll have some of these mutual exclusion resources where there are certain things, certain operations that need to feel as if they're they're ones that you can only that, that you can only have one process working or using them at, at once at one time. And you use um, and the problem is that your code can be lots of instructions long. So what you do is you, is you use what's called mutual exclusion and you implement that in a variety of ways to try to make sure only one person's accessing. So if you guys, did they talk about locks at all as a way of? Yeah. Okay, so, so locks. Synchronization with threads in Java. Pardon? We do synchronization of threads in Java. Okay, synchronization of threads in Java, locks. This locks is a way to do this mutual exclusion. So, in, so you, probably, you, know, you grab a lock. Once you have that lock, no one else can be running in that code. When you're done, you release it and someone else can grab it. So the question is, how do you take that paradigm and apply it in a distributed system? Now, one of the key assumptions you made in this being able to grab locks and release them is that the, the processes that are running on your machine that are grabbing these locks, that you'll have that you have very reliable communication with them. Right? If so, uh, and that the other thing you may or may not have assumed is how whether these processes are going to crash, right? Because if you have a, imagine your process, you have a lock, and then you crash, then <laughs> what? You know, when do you get that lock back? Um, fortunately, the operating system might be able to tell whether something's crashed, and when it does, then it could go through and say, "Okay, this process had these five locks. I'm going to release them." Um, so you can have some amount of, of failure detection and of crash recovery. But in a distributed system, we're in a totally different ball game. We don't know whether, especially in an asynchronous system, we don't know, for example, whether um, a message that we send is going to actually be has actually been received, and whether an acknowledgement has actually been sent necessarily in a best efforts type of network. Um, we it's very hard to detect whether somebody out there has failed, and that's because you don't know whether you, it's very hard to tell the difference between someone out there failing, and the message just and the network actually just not delivering the acknowledge an acknowledgement back. So these are the kinds of issues you have with with uh, distributed mutual exclusion. Um, one of the like, why would you want to use this? Well, remember how we talked about distributed file systems yesterday? Imagine that there were some critical files that you didn't want to have two people accessing at once and modifying, because if you did, it would be a disaster. What's a good example of that? Your DNS tables on your root server, right? I mean. Forget all this, you know, file caching, and you know, like you want one person accessing that file at any one time because you mess that up, and you can have huge problems, global problems. Um, one of the things that a couple of the objectives when you have distributed mutual exclusion is, you, is uh, they're very similar to what normally you would want when you have mutual exclusion, which is safety, which means that's that's the definition that only one process can be using this shared resource or be in this critical section at any one time. And the second one is fairness. And this one is the one that's a bit more important when it comes to distributed systems. Fairness can mean things like liveness. So you can't get into deadlock. You don't want to be, get into any deadlock type situations. You guys talked about deadlock. Lots of people want a resource at the same time. Who gets to get it? Who gets to, to, to grab it first? Now, in, in an operating system, because things are, you know, if there's one CPU and only one, one thing is running at a time, then when somebody wants it, then you, know, you can figure out whether they get it or not right then and there. Um, but in a distributed system where you have lots of, different, lots of different processes, now someone who might have priority, their message might come in a little bit later than someone who doesn't. So you have to take that into account. So some of the objectives that you want in any type of uh, distributed mutual exclusion algorithm, um, low bandwidth and latency. You don't want a bunch of packets eating up the network. Um, and then you, don't, you also want to minimize the, uh, the impact on the peak rate at which the, at which the resource can be accessed. So what that means is you don't want some algorithm that, that will figure out who should have access eventually, like after an hour or after some, um, some unbounded amount of time. You want something that figures out who's going to have access to that resource very quickly so that resource can be shared effectively. So the so very simple algorithm is called the, um, to do distributed uh, mutual exclusion, is called the central server algorithm. And here what you have is uh, a central server 
that set, that decides who gets access. So it, it uh, gives out the locks. So if you have somebody here and somebody here, this guy could say, I want access to, to this to a given resource. And then the, the central server can say, OK, does anyone else does anyone else have access? Have I granted anyone else access right now? Uh, no. So I'll tell you that you can have it. And so at that point, the um, this one now it now records that. So we call this P1 and P2. It now records that P1 has is currently accessing that that resource. Now when P1's done, it'll say. I'm done, and then this records now that, that it's free. Okay, so that's a pretty simple algorithm. Um, if you notice, the, let's see what impact this has on performance. Well, to acquire the resource is going to take a couple of round trips, uh, a couple round trip messages, and then to release it is going to take one message. And at that point, it's ready to be. That message actually arrives. That's right. That's right. So there's, this is a very simple algorithm because there's a lot of different assumptions underlying it that, in practice, um, can actually bite you. So one of them is assuming that these messages actually arrive. So imagine that you know, this message could, could, could go bad or this one could go bad. If this, let's, well, let's take each of them. If this first one doesn't arrive, then P1's going to be sitting there waiting, not, not you know, saying, I, I need this thing, and why am I not being given it? The resource could be totally free. Uh, and P1 won't have access to it. If this one, uh, if this message dies, then we're in a little bit more serious situation because now the resource has been allocated to somebody, and that somebody doesn't know it, so they're not using it, and no one else can use it at this point. Um, and then if this last message dies, then P1's done. Again, the resource is free, uh, but. But the, the, again, it's being, held, it's being locked because the central server doesn't know what's, what's going on. So this type of, this type of uh, algorithm works a lot better when you're on, a, on one system and you assume reliability. But as soon as you start getting more distributed, it starts not working as well. So on an, on an Ethernet, probably will probably work you know, reasonably well because you're not, unless someone starts snipping the, the cables, you know, you, it's, there's a good chance that these messages will make it you know, relatively with rel relative certainty, um, but as soon as you start getting beyond that and going onto the broader internet, this type of, of distribution mechanism doesn't work as well. There are other lots of other algorithms for doing distributed mutual exclusion, as you can imagine. Um, there are several in the in the book in the text. One of them actually uses um, multicasting clocks. And what this one does is that you have, you have these messages which are based on, um, which you can, for each process. So imagine that there's a set of processes, P1, P2, P3, so on. And they all want to gain access to some resource. Well, what you do is you say, the algorithm goes, I'll tell everyone that I want to have access to this resource. And what I'll do is I won't grab that resource until everyone's told me that it's OK to grab that resource. So if I do that, then well, one of the things you get out of it is you know that no one else is in the critical section, that no one else is using it. So you know there's some, there's, that you get safety out of this. Then one question is, how do you manage the case when two of these are asking for a resource at the same time? So let's say, let's say I ask. So let's say let's say there. Let's say P1 asks P2, and P2 says okay. This this one says P1 asks P5. P5 says okay. Then P3 asks P4, and then P4 says okay to P3. Right? What happens when P1 asks P3? Or I'm sorry, P4. Let's do that one first. P4 has already said OK to P3. So how do you resolve situations like that? Well, the way you do it is you set you have an ordering criteria so that any one of these messages that goes out, there's a complete order. 
between them. So you'll you have you know a complete it means that for any two of these there's a greater than or less than relationship that you can discover. So what you do is what P4 will do is it'll say, well I'm I've already told someone else okay. But if that message that comes in over here has greater, I'll call it priority or greater order than than the one I got before, I'll tell this guy okay. So the reason that this will actually work, that he's already told two people OK, is that when P1 goes to ask P3, P3 will say, oh, someone else wants this. OK, and that person has greater priority. So I'll give them the, you know, I'll, I'll tell OK to them. So as P1, if this is the one that, that has the greatest priority, goes out and asks everyone, either they're in, they're in a state where they haven't told anybody OK, in which case they say back, go ahead, or if someone's already told someone else OK, if you have greater priority, you go back and tell them OK. Now the reason P3 will never, that you'll never get the safety constraint is because if P3 asks P1, can I get this resource, then P1's going to say, well, I have greater priority than P3, so I'm not going to say OK. So there'll always be the, one, the person who has the greater priority who's asking of the one or of the two or three or four will, will always say no. Uh -huh. How do you ensure that the messages are totally ordered? So there's a thing called a Lamport clock that they describe in the text. And what this thing does is, is, it, is it, there's the one thing that you can do is um, look at the time. So you can try to use the timestamp as an ordering criteria. And then what you can say is, well, the timestamp uh, is the same. Then I'll use something like the process ID as to, and so as long as the process IDs are, have a complete order on them, then you can have a complete order. And the, the reason you want to use some kind of, of clock synchronization is because you want these timestamps to be relatively close to each other so you can have some notion of fairness. What you, really, what you really prefer is not to have to use this because that requires you to have a complete order or a priority on these. What you'd rather use is just the timestamp. You'd rather you prefer the first person who wants this to actually be able to get it. Okay. Um, and of course, once you've once you've released your once you've released your once you don't need to be in there anymore, um, then if someone else needs it, then you'll say you know go ahead. Now there's optimizations you can do here. So for example, suppose P1 asks for this and everyone else says okay, and then P1 is done using it. If P1 hasn't heard from anyone else that they that 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 someone else wants to use it, they can just start using it again. Because if no one else, because no one else is going to use that until they've, at the very least, have asked P1. So there's certain optimizations you can do to try to minimize the amount of these messages that go back and forth. So this distributed mutual exclusion. Um, <coughs> is a great tool to use to access shared resources, but it's actually a, an instance of a more broad general problem uh, in, when you're thinking about coordination in distributed systems. And this is called consensus. And as you can imagine, distributed mutual exclusion is a form of consensus. People have to agree on something. These processes have to agree on something. There's other types of consensus like elections. Everyone you know, votes and the, the winner ends up being somewhat determined by a majority type of, of situation. Um, but in general, uh, the consensus problem is that each process suggests, um, each process suggests a value. And all n processes in this consensus system have to agree on what the value is going to be. So in this case, the value is uh, who gets the which process here gets, the, gets to enter the critical section, gets the lock. Uh, and they all have to agree that, that, one is gonna, that no one else is going to go in there when one has the lock. Um, now, do you guys, remember the, uh, you guys remember the two generals problem that we talked about before? That's another consensus one, where you have a, two generals. And I know this is a little bit of a horrific type of but this is the way, this is the way that these things are. That these I'll, I'll respect the the way that these guys phrase their examples. Um, you have a couple generals. They need to attack. If they both attack at the same time, then they can take the city. 
if they can't attack, if they, one attacks and one doesn't, then they lose, that, they lose their army. They can send messages back and forth, but there can be snipers along the way that can block these messages. So there's a, um, there's a more general sense of this problem, which is called the Byzantine generals uh, problem, which uh, in this case, the assumption is that you, you can have more generals. And they all have to decide whether to attack or retreat. And the, the one interesting um, twist to this is that, well, before I get into that, the, you can assume that one of these generals is the commander, and the rest of them are the sort of the, the commander's lieutenants. And the, what the commander says is, is, you know, attack or retreat, and then tells that to its, all, its, all his lieutenants. The lieutenants then tell each other, this is what I heard my commander say, attack or retreat. And at some point, they all have to decide whether to attack or retreat. Now, the twist is that one of these, there can be treachery. So one of these guys can say, can decide, I'm going to say the opposite. I'm going to try to screw up the system, and I'm going to say the opposite of this. Um, now, to give this a bit more of a real and, and, and sort of humanitarian type of, of feel, think about the systems on the space shuttle. Right? Imagine that there's one system that, that says, OK, I, let's, you know, all systems are go, and tells that to all its subsystems. And then all the subsystems need to tell each other, you know, all systems are go, all systems are go. And then they all have to agree on whether to launch or to abort. Uh, but now, imagine that one of these systems is faulty. And in the worst case, you know, you can think of, think of it as the worst case would be sabotage, that someone tries to program it such that it gives the wrong answer. You still want it to be the case that, the, 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 whether, that it does the right thing, either it launches or it aborts. Um, so this, these types of, this type of consensus problem is quite real. Um, and that's one class of this problem, and we're going to get into it a little bit more. Um, there's another one which is about, uh, there's another way to phrase consensus, which is interactive consistency. And that's when each process uh, suggests a value. And we, what you have to agree on at the end is a vector of values. So one per each, one per each process. So this is a way of saying everyone has to agree, for example, on what each person's priority is going to be. Or everyone has to agree on what every uh, what piece of the problem each everyone else is going to take. So I've started explaining this problem already. One thing we're assuming here is that there isn't any form of authentication. And one of the reasons you can assume that is because if you assume authentication, then that's a security that could be there's a potential security hole there because anytime you assume authentication, there's a, there's always some way to get around it. Security can always be broken. So let's just assume that you know security has been broken and one of these guys has been compromised, and you don't know which one. And that maps, maps very well to the space shuttle problem because in the space shuttle problem, even if you're not thinking of it in terms of security, it's possible, for example, that a bug could be in, in the code. And so you want to be resilient against there being bugs that are very well intentioned, that had nothing to do with security, but still cause the, the exact wrong thing to happen. Else? Yes. You hear all the lieutenants talk to each other, and you hear from your commander who says, who gives you know, the, the command, attack or retreat. So in the space shuttle, you know, this could be mission command that tells the, the space shuttle subsystems, all of them, go. And now they all have to talk to each other. And, and either and, and do the right thing. Um, and you know it could be the other it could be that the I mean the, the reason you this problem maps very well is because if the mission command says go if, and something's wrong, then the subsystems need to be need to be able to figure that out. Um, so, so there's actually a lot of theory around this, as you can imagine. There's some interesting proofs, um, which if you like proofs, um, you know, they're, they're, it's great things to, to read in the book. If you don't like proofs, it's, it's good just to get the, 
distill out what, what it implies. Um, but in this case, what they found is if f is equal to the number of failed or treacherous generals, then for this type in a synchronous system, it's impossible to come up with a solution if n, the number, is less than or equal to 3 times f. So one thing that you can try uh, as, an, as a, uh, an example is to imagine that you had three, you had one commander, and then you had two lieutenants, and one of these three um, was faulty, was going to say the wrong thing. So you're going to have the communication. These guys are going to be communicating to each other, and if you can actually go through the different cases and show that that you won't be able to tell that the difference here as to uh, whether to do the right thing or not. Now, if you add one more to this, then what you'll be able to do is actually use the majority vote. Uh, look at a majority to see which one, what the right thing is to do. Um, but in, in the case of if there's, you know, if you add another, if you say two of these are failed, then you're back to the case where you can't do it. Um, now, the, one of the key, one of the other key outcomes here is that in, in an asynchronous, and this is in a synchronous system. So let, let me just make sure that all the assumptions are clear here. In a synchronous system, when you say when you say it's time to receive a message, and you don't get the message, you assume that that's that was something that either that system failed or that it's something that was meant to be. But there is supposed to be a, the messages are supposed to arrive at given points in time. That's different than an asynchronous system where you don't know where you don't know how long a message is going to take to get to you. So the reason that you can't that this is that this solving this problem is theoretically impossible in an in an asynchronous system is that there's no way to tell the difference between slowness or 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 something like failure. And the best example of that is the two generals problem. So the, just to review that, in the two generals problem, you're sending a message over saying, you know, we're going to attack at dawn. And, and then you're expecting to receive back a message that says, OK, I heard that, I, you, know, I heard that, you, that you can attack at dawn. That's, that's great. Let's do that. And if in an asynchronous system, one, I mean, if you have these, in other words, if you have these snipers, which means that some of these messages could fail, if uh, this if this message is never if this message gets intercepted, then you'll never get this message back. Okay, that's fine. But say this message is not intercepted, but this one is. You still get nothing back. So in that case, if you were to say if you were to say, um, well, if I get nothing back, I'm just gonna sue. I'm just gonna not attack. Well, in this case here, this general thinks it's supposed to attack, uh, but this one doesn't. In this case here, then it's OK. So you're gonna, you, it's very possible you can make a wrong decision. So let's say, oh, well, this is easy. I'll send another message back and tell that general that you know, I, I acknowledge. Well, you run into the same problem. What if this message gets, gets dumped? Well, and this one is OK. Well, then you're in the situation that this general thinks it's OK to attack, and this one doesn't. And you can, you can play this game back and forth, back and forth. And as long as there's, the, the prob there's a possibility that the last message that you send can get nuked, then in an asynchronous system, you're never going to solve this type of problem with theoretical 100% uh, reliability. So what this means is that for these consensus problems, it's, again, another game of trade-offs. You have to. You have to. Um, you, you, there's there's a different ways you can make these trade-offs. One is is to put more resources into trying to make this more reliable. So in the space shuttle, for example, that's one of the things you probably want to do is have redundant systems that take their redundant communication systems. So imagine that this general sends out ten people at a time. Right now, the chance and suppose that the chance of any one of them getting nailed is is uh, one half. 
right? If you send 10 people out at a time, what's the chance that all of them are going to get nailed? Right, so the chance that all of them get nailed is one half times one half times for all ten. So this is one over a thousand. Now the nice thing about this is here's here's how you get around this theoretic impossibility, if you're willing to put enough resource and can put enough resources into it. Notice that this. How does this? What's the order of growth of this here? It's exponential. So this thing gets exponentially smaller as you add just one more one more redundant cable here. Right? So imagine that, that you get to the point where suppose that um, S for screwed is the probability that you um, that some that some cosmic ray comes in and you know and destroys your you know your one of your critical systems. Right? Very low probability but it's there, it exists. What you can do is try to is try to figure out what this what this number is here. Such that the probability that this that this that all of your messages get hosed is less than this this probability which you're willing to tolerate. So in all in, in, in all systems, there's there's got to be some probability that you're willing to tolerate of, of for failure, and that's usually something you pick you pick something where you just have absolutely no control or where there's no way you're ever going to be able to predict or, or deal with it. And because this is exponential, then it gives you it gives you some chance of being able to make to be able to get um, uh, with with reasonable probability to make this work in an asynchronous system. What's another way that you can besides just communication channels? You can try something like duplicate subsystems, so that if imagine that you have that this general is really sort of a uh, uh, you know, dual personality. Generally, you have two two of these side by side, and they both have to, to come up with or three. Let's let's pick three. That's a better example. You have three of them, and they all three have to agree on what on what the right answer is. So if one of these fails, then you have the other two, and you can do you can decide which one by simple majority here. But the key is that because they're close to each other, then the probability that these that there'll be some failure. You know that close to each other is is a lot less than that than some than some system that's far away. So that's why you hear about the space shuttle having these redundant backup systems, and that's why when one of these backup systems goes before the launch, you really, you know, you'd you'd prefer to uh, to abort the launch because you never know. You know, later on you might this might become a weak link, and if you have too many of them, you could get hosed. Okay, so for the um, for the uh, for the readings, um, there's a couple things that I w that um, you should focus on. There's a lot of pages of reading in this in these two chapters that I've assigned the time and then the coordination. Um, but the main thing you should get at it from the time sense is the idea that there is no global time and that there are lots of different ways to try to cord to try to synchronize. And think about the you know there's the different algorithms and how you might approach synchronization and and what they're useful for. For the consensus. Um, one of the this is gr a great way to think about failure and about how to deal with failure. Um, and again, there there's some proofs and there's some different mechanisms. But think about what how you break out the space of what you want to do. So there's asynchronous versus isynchronous systems, and there's different ways of of, uh, of phrasing this problem that makes it easier to analyze, like the generals versus the inconsistency uh, the, or the uh, the uh, the vectors. This lecture is a little short because I need to make it over to the to the train. But are there any questions on this? Mm -hmm. In generals, we know there are n generals, but with the peers, we don't know if someone is dead, so we can't at any no moment know what n is. That's right, and in fact, that's the question. One of the that's the question on the uh, for the writing assignment is around failure detection, because I mean, in this case, you know, and for each of there's about three different algorithms that they sh that they talk about in the book. But you can imagine, you know, what happens to each of these if there's a failure, right? Then this thing starts looking a little bit more. This just this distributed mutual exclusion starts looking a little bit more like this consensus. So that's why that's why consensus is an important thing to study because this, you know, if you think about distributed mutual exclusion, once you start thinking about failures, it becomes the the flavor changes dramatically. <laughs>
to something like this. And actually, some of these algorithms react very well. If you can detect a failure, it's very easy. And some of them actually are just are, you know, have completely bad behavior if there's a, if you, if there's a failure that you can't detect. Um, if you can detect a flavor, you get a, a different set of, of, of reaction, a different set of, of results from using these different mutual exclu distributed mutual exclusion algorithms. So that's one of the key, th I mean, in a real system, it's, there's a poss possibility for failure. So that's why I asked you to, to look at these algorithms and how they, wh how they react to failures. What part of the system is arbitrating this consensus? Because I'm, I'm thinking of you know, several mm -hmm. processes that are running just on, a, on an individual computer. And generally, you know, the abstraction barriers of the operating system is what's sort of like you know, kind of arbitrating which processes get resources at what time. Mm -hmm. And that the processes themselves, we don't want them to have to be concerned with the existence of other processes because we want to keep things simple. So, mm -hmm. so if we have something like consensus where the processes are sort of communicating to each other, mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Is there like an intermediate layer? I mean, it's typically in a distributed mutual exclusion, it's typically a, a layer or a protocol that you develop. And they, all, they do have to agree on it. Um, so something like a, um, like a token ring, architecture which is uh, it's unlike ethernet in the sense that if you have a token that means you can use this resource and you can use it without worrying about anyone else using it so the idea there is to use it more effectively but if you have a token ring type type of architecture and you try to put an ethernet card on that same cable because they're different protocols it's not going to work too well so these types of these one of the assumptions you have to make is that what the processes involved wherever they might be all agree on the algorithm they're going to use. If they don't, then you can have, then all of a sudden safety might be violated. Another thing that might be violated is fairness. So that's, that's, that's in some systems, fairness is very important. If you have priority over somebody else, here's how it's, that's defined, and you have, to, you have to give up, like in this, in this case here. So if you're, if you're building one of these processes, you know, developing the application, then you need to know what protocol is going to be used underneath for Yeah. And here's here's where you get um, here's where you have to uh, be a little bit careful, which is that if you um, some of these depending on the type of algorithm that's being used or protocol, you may have different f types of errors that come back. Right. So in so, in one of these algorithms, like uh, that that we talked about and that you see in the book also, um, fail you can have a timeout because something goes down and it fails, and then there might be a timeout. So you have to have a way of dealing with that, and. You, if you build that into the layer, then the then and the application you know doesn't handle that, then the layer might do the wrong thing or do something that costs too much. So that, and if but so a lot of times you want to build that into the application, so the application knows if there's a failure in this, here's how I'm going to handle it. I'll tell the user or I'll turn myself off or do something like that. Um, but it's again, it's the end-to-end -end argument. Um, but there, you can also, and the reason I say that is because you can imagine there being a distribute. Imagine that there's a layer that's just a generic interface, distributed mutual exclusion. You know, grab lock, release lock, right, or something, something that simple. Um, that's great from an abstraction point of view, but from a very practical point of view, it's some. It's probably not enough when you're when you're when the, the goal is to make sure that you have adequate access to some shared resource out there. Yes. Um, you mentioned this in the context of um, different. Or, or different nodes trying to run a piece of code, which makes it sound as though they might be trying to run a piece of code on a central server. But presumably in systems like SETI, these systems would be used to allocate the collective um, memory and even processor resources that are available for each other. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know the, about, I haven't read about the um, SETI architecture, but you can imagine that there might be, imagine there are a few servers, a few SETI servers. There's, there's probably ways that you can pre-allocate blocks of, of computation to each of them so that it, even if they get cut off, that they can, that they can send the, the, right stuff, the right stuff out. So because you can pre-allocate, I'm not so sure that you would, they would need to, to, to be mutually exclusive over the, the body of, of code that, that, or the body of, of data that needs to be allocated out to the clients. Um, so I, I don't. I'm not. Maybe the, maybe there there is something there, but the the main. Let me the, come up with a different example of what you things things that you'd want to share. Um, so file access is is one. So having being able to access some file on a distributed server somewhere. 
uh, is one. Um, another one is uh, access to a bank account. So imagine that somebody, that there's, uh, your bank account is out, your, the numbers are out there somewhere, and there's a couple of you know, ATMs and there's some clearing, you know, direct deposits that are going through and all this stuff could be happening at the same time. You want to be able to have, if that's a distributed resource, you want to be able to have uh, exclusive access to it so that every, every uh, transaction gets done independently. Um, so, uh, so, that's, so that kind of data, it's usually data in this case for distributed. It's, there's, there's data out there that needs to be, sh that needs to be uh, which can't be modified um, uh, by any, when it, that, when, such that when it's modified, it has to be one process that's modifying it at a time. Um, there's real-time systems, I would guess. So you can imagine, um, your, uh, imagine you have a home automation system. And there's, uh, there's different signals coming in, some from the security system, some from you monitoring things, saying you can open doors. Um, depending on how these, the individual, um, let's say you have an actuator that op opens your door or closes it, you, uh, you may want to have exclusive, mutually exclusive access to that so that if it gets two signals that it actually, that it follows the protocol that that device expects as opposed to getting some random bits and you know, maybe it just leaves your door open and, and instead of closing it. So I'm just, I'm just brainstorming, but those are the kinds of things that you would want access, mutual exclusive so access to. Distributed systems that, that were involved in kind of processing um, use of memory, I mean, substantial use of memory and processor time on the nodes, they would work in a different way where you, they would, most of the ones I've heard about simply say, okay, do this stuff when there's nothing else happening and there's not any real urgency to return the process. Yeah, I mean, there's, there, it, the more that, that that resource is accessed, the more important that these algorithms become. So if it's something that's, that's got very little access to it, like let's say, you know, you have, you have a, you know, most bank accounts are probably, there's very little access, but you need extremely high reliability. But imagine something that's being accessed a lot, like some door at some front door at some business where people are constantly going in and out and there's some kind of authentication that needs to go through. And, um, and then there, and if that if that is a resource, you know that that is that's being accessed by a lot of different folks. You know the the command of whether to open that door or not, and the protocol being used. Then you want the bits sent to that to be in a pack, well-defined packet, and you don't want lots of people trying to send interleave bits to that one controller there because it might fail. So there's it, so that that's why what earlier we talked about um, being able that it, you need one of the uh, concerns that you have to have is around how well your your resource gets utilized because you can it's easy to come up with algorithms that sit there and wait forever and you know and take a long time to figure something out but that's not going to work too well if if you're what you're dealing with is a resource that that needs that has high utilization demands on it other questions <laughs>